Review Sunday, the parable of the persistent widow. We we study three main points. First of all, why do we pray? When should we pray? And how to pray? Uh, just a quick recap, maybe for those who were not here, we saw that uh, we pray because we love God, and that love actually it doesn't start when we are born. When we were born, it started actually when we truly come to Christ. Because indeed, when we come to Christ, we realize the first thing for every true born-again Christian is to realize that he has been justified through the sacrifice of, cross, uh, of Christ on the cross. And as we realize that we have been justified, we have been forgiven for our sins out of love from God, our response is to love God. And as we love Him, we will be drawn near, closer to Him. And as we come closer to Him, we will find the hidden treasures in Christ. And that's how we fall in love. And the more we fall in love, the more we would like to stay with Him, to become more intimate with Him. And this is called prayer. So that's how we have a life of prayer, by falling in love with Christ. And we also saw that uh, we are supposed to pray always, that prayer is even a lifestyle, it covers so many aspects of our life. And then we also saw that uh, we pray with faith, because faith is a trust. And as we pray, we have this trust in God that all the situations we are going through in our life, they have been allowed by God for our good. Romans chapter 8 verse 28 says that everything works for the good of those who love God. And therefore, even including the challenges, the trials that we face, the suffering, they are part of God's plan. And as such, we have trust and so we pray with faith, believing that everything we go through is the will of God for our good as well. Now, this morning, we are going to continue on prayer. And actually, after the last sermon, uh, one sister and one brother, they came separately to me. And uh, they, they confessed to me that uh, their life of prayer is not really what it should be after the service. And the brother actually went even further, he mentioned, he even asked for advice how to come out of this prayerless life. Now what this brother and this sister did last Sunday when they came to me and asked those questions, they were actually being shameless. They came with a shameless audacity, audacity is courage. So they had the courage to come and to expose their struggle, their weaknesses in their spiritual life. Maybe this morning, you also have some struggles in your spiritual life. But the difference between you and the brother and the sister who came last Sunday is that like many of us, including myself, we don't like to expose ourselves. To be like that shameless audacity, that shameless courage, we don't have it. And the shameless audacity is precisely what the Lord Jesus is talking about in this parable. This parable about this friend who went to the midnight to ask his neighbor to give him bread. Now, if you look at carefully this text, it already started, the very first verse started already with one disciple having the shameless courage to come to the Lord Jesus and to ask him this question, teach us how to pray like John the Baptist taught his disciple. Now, you may know that the Lord Jesus were, was followed by a crowd of disciples, not only 12. The 12 were actually called out of the crowd to become the apostles. So they were not only disciples, but apostles. But they were, there was a crowd. And out of all this crowd, only one disciple dared to come to Jesus and say, teach us how to pray like John the Baptist told the disciples. So basically, this disciple, he was shameless to say, look, you know what? I think John disciples are doing better than me. And I would like to imitate them. Therefore, can you also teach me? And we can be thankful to that disciple because if he didn't ask this question to Jesus, maybe we would never have the Lord's Prayer. The Lord's Prayer is the response of Jesus to this disciple asking how to, to, to pray. So we have this Lord's Prayer. But not only the disciple was praised by the Lord Jesus because he answered the question by giving the Lord's Prayer. But even he 
told that story of the parable of the persistent, oh sorry, of the uh, of this friend in need. And in that parable, if you look at carefully, around the end, he was praising the shameless audacity of that man who went in midnight to disturb his neighbor. So shameless audacity or courage is one key to unlock our life of prayer. Now the Lord Jesus is basically encouraging us to be shameless as we come to pray. And maybe this morning, you can ask yourself, have you ever been shameless and courageous to ask something to someone to help you in the body of Christ? Have you, for instance, asked another lady, could you please tell me, teach me, how do you do to be such a godly wife in your marriage? Maybe... Did you ever ask someone, how did you do to raise your children in such a godly manner in the fear of the Lord? Maybe you never dare to ask this question because you don't have that shameless courage. Maybe you never ask someone, how do you do to have such a disciplined life of prayer and Bible reading every morning? How do you do that? Or maybe you never ask someone, how do you do to never miss a Bible study? Because I always find all kind of activities and things that clash with my schedule, with my timetable. How do you do to come always and relate to Bible study? How do you do that? Or maybe you never ask someone, how do you do to obey that very challenging verse in Ephesians 5 verse 23 onwards, which says, wife be submissive to your husband as in the Lord. This is extremely challenging nowadays. Maybe you never ask someone to tell you, how do you do that? Maybe you never ask another man, how do you do to be the head of your family? Like it is described in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 25 onwards, that men are supposed to love their wife, to be the head of the family, like Christ loves the church. All kind of questions. Maybe you never ask someone, how did you do? Because I heard your testimony that you used to be addicted to pornography. You used to be addicted to smoking, to alcohol. How did you do to come out of this? Maybe you never ask that. And the reason why you never ask, the reason why I never ask maybe, is because I like shameless audacity, shameless courage. And that's precisely what the Lord Jesus is asking us to do if we want to have an effective life of prayer. But he also, he also gives us an additional keys, two other keys of life of prayer. So the first one is the shameless courage. The second one is that prayer is effective if the petitioner is a son or a daughter to God. He talks about the Father in heaven. He talks about your Father who will give you good gift. So the petition has to be a son and a daughter of God. You will see that later in the sermon. And then the last key is prayer is effective if the petition is to glorify God. You will see that in the Lord's prayer, the things that the Lord is asking us to pray for, they are all to glorify God. And you will see that in details in some moment. Now let's start with the first part. Prayer is effective if it is done with shameless courage. One of the reasons why we sometimes struggle to understand the scriptures is because we read the scriptures with our 21st century lenses. And it's important, especially the parable of the Lord Jesus, which were stories, which he used actually to convey a truth to people. So he used the daily life stories, things which happen in the daily life, farmers, workers in the vineyard, to so use those daily stories so that they can relate to the characters of the story and then they can get the truth of the message. Now this parable of the friend in need if we, need, if we want to understand it, we need first to understand the culture in the Middle East in the first century, in the Bible time. Now, in the Middle East, hospitality was a big deal. And I think it is still the case nowadays. Sharing a meal with someone has a deep meaning. Sharing a meal with someone means to identify with that person. It's like making that person part of your family, part of your community. And that's why the Lord Jesus gave us the Lord's Supper as a symbol to remind us that we are part of his family. He could have given another symbol, but the symbol of the meal was very powerful in the Middle East in the first century. 
And also you see several times in the Bible, the Pharisees, for instance, they were shocked when they saw the Lord Jesus eating with sinners like the Pharisees. Matthew chapter 9, for instance, the Lord Jesus was eating with tax collectors. Tax collectors, they were notorious sinners in those days. So he was eating with sinners and the Pharisees were shocked. They were, they said, how can you do that? Because for them, they do understand, they did understand that sharing the meal with someone means that person is part of the family. So for them, Jesus and sinners, so they were together part of the same family. How oh, comes? So the point here, I just would like to give you the context is that sharing a meal was very important because it tells the person that you receive, that you welcome your house, that that person is welcome and is part of your family, your community. Now, imagine that these men who receive this visitor coming to his place and he has no bread, he has nothing to share. That will be a terrible offense to the visitor if he doesn't share, if he didn't share the meal. So he had to do all kind of effort in order to find bread. For him, it was extremely important. Nowadays, you may not relate to that and say, oh, come on, he comes so late. That's his problem. He has to wait. Now, in the first century, it wasn't like that. Now, this man was in the trouble, he needed to find bread. And then he went, shame, without any shame. He was ready to go and disturb his friend, his neighbor in midnight. And you see, when you read, the neighbor actually didn't want to give him. He said, come on, it's too late, the kids are sleeping. But you see, even if the, the children were sleeping, the neighbor would give the bread. And the reason why he gave the bread was not because of the friendship at all. The reason why he gave the bread is because of the shameless courage. So when you look at his friend coming to him, say, wow, this man, in order to do such a thing, to come at midnight and to insist and to ask for bread, he must really be in need. This is a terrible situation he must be in. I have to help him. You know, he basically broke the code of self-dignity. Maybe the equivalent of that nowadays is like, you go and you ask one of your neighbors to borrow you money. Nowadays, if we go and we ask someone to give us money, we would be ashamed. But if you are really in trouble, you will beg. You know, Jesus said, the kingdom of God in the, in the Sermon on the Mount, he said, Blessed are the poor, for the kingdom of God is theirs. When you say that, it means we do, you need, you and I, we need to have that mindset of being in need when you come to pray. And that friend, knowing that this is a desperate situation, I need to help him. And the same way, when God sees that we really need that thing we are asking, and you will see what are the things we need to ask God, not anything. God will be moved, like this friend was moved in his heart. I need to wake up and help him. And that's the same thing that happens if we come shamelessly before God. You know, in the Bible, we have similar stories. There was a Canaanite woman in Matthew chapter 15. You may remember that story. She came and she asked Jesus to heal her daughter who was demon-possessed. You can find that story in Matthew chapter 15. And the Lord Jesus had a very strange response. In the first place, the Lord Jesus didn't say anything. The Bible said he was silent. I mean, someone come and ask you something, you don't say a word, you are silent. That's what the Lord Jesus said. You read carefully, that's what it is reported. And then the woman insisted. And then the Lord Jesus said something very shocking to that woman. He said in verse 27, no, sorry, in verse 26, he said, it is not right to take the children's bread and toss it to the dog. Basically, he was calling that woman dog. So she was not Jewish. And you can say this was a racist statement from the Lord Jesus. Because she did not belong to the Jewish community, the Lord Jesus said, I cannot give you what you asked for. And you see the response of the woman? She said, yes, Lord, verse 27, even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from the master's table. And you know what the what Lord Jesus did at that moment? We read in verse 28, then Jesus said to her, woman, you have great faith. Your request is granted. And her daughter was healed at that moment. Brothers and sisters, this is here a profound truth about the secret of an effective prayer. When we come to pray before God, 
do we come shamelessly showing our struggle, pouring out our heart before the Lord and say, Lord, I am in need. I need you to come and help me. Now, someone may say, oh, God is a strange father. What is this kind of father who wants his children to come and beg him in order to give him something? That's strange, right? I mean, it would look like God would be a sadistic father. Now, you know what? And I hope you will get this point. Shamelessness or shameless audacity. When we do it in the presence of God or in the presence of God's family, it's not shameful. It's not shameful because, you know, in every family, we have family secrets. And those family secrets, we don't want to share them outside. If people find out what is going on in our household, it will be a shame for many things, right? There are many things we keep between us, our wife, and our children. Now, within our family, it's not shameful at all. It's shameful only if it goes outside. The reason why some of us think that coming before God, and even in the assembly of God, or maybe with your prayer partner, and saying, this is what I'm struggling right now with, that addiction, that uh, lack of forgiveness, or whatever. It is shameful only if you think this is not your family. If you are like a stranger, if God is a stranger indeed, it will be shameful. But if he's your father, it will not be shameful. That's the meaning. That's why. So God is not a sadistic father. He's not saying, yeah, you have to beg him. No, he's simply saying, I want you to behave like a son and daughter. I want you to be able to come as you are. Honestly, with all your heart. Now, someone may say, well, in this congregation, I don't feel comfortable to come and open my heart and make a prayer before everyone. Mm. I'm a bit ashamed to do that because I'm not comfortable. I just arrived in this church. Uh, when people start to pray and raise their voice, I'm not going to do that. I don't feel secure. Well, I can understand that. However, there is a promise of Jesus in Matthew chapter 18, verse 19 to 20, where he says, I truly I tell you that if two of you on earth agree about anything they ask for, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. For where two or three gather in my name, there I am with them. Now you may not pray in this congregation because you just arrived, you are not saved. But if you are married, you have a husband, you have a wife. And the Bible says, whenever two or three gather. So, if your husband, your wife is Christian, of course. Then you have a prayer partner. Now the question now would be for you, if you are married, is your husband aware of your spiritual struggle? If your wife, is your wife aware of what you are going through? Do you bring that together before God? Now if you don't do it, then because maybe there is a lack of shameless audacity, again. And so don't, we don't have any excuse, actually. There is always a circle where we can with another brother, another sister, trustworthy Christian, come and say, let's pour out our heart before the Lord. We are not ashamed because we are within the same family. You know, the Lord Jesus, he used to pray in the night and in the evening, in the, in the night and in the morning, early in Mark chapter 1, verse 35, for instance. Early in the morning or in the night. Now, talking about husband and wife, you know, The night and the morning, this is where, within the marriage, you see your true wife and your true husband. No? There is no makeup in the morning. This is the real life, uh, actually, for some people, they say it's day and night, with makeup or without makeup. This is the true wife that you have married, without makeup. But it's not only the wife, also the husband. Some of us, uh, we snore when we sleep. Some of them we cease to be gentlemen in the night. I have been told a story recently by a relatively old lady that in the night her husband keeps farting. <laughs> but that's her husband. That's who he is. She knows exactly who this man is. 
You know, our wife, our spouse, our husband, they know truly who we are. We cannot hide. We are who we are with them. You know, there was a terrible story that happened to me. You went to visit a, a friend, you went to travel, we arrive, they give us a nice bedroom. And because of the time zone, I was so tired. And then I made a dream. You know those dreams where you are in the bathroom and you think it's real? But you realize it is taking long. And then you realize you are actually doing it in the bed. So when I wake up, I was tempted to call my to call Marie to say, maybe she should come in our bedroom. So that if they found out, I can say, no, Marie was with us. Now that's what's shameful, right? That's shameful. But you know what? Marie now knows it. She's my wife, she knows who I am. This is who I am. When we come before God, that shamelessness is a key that shows that we are truly with our Father. And this is what moves God's heart. And that will take us to the next point of this sermon, that the prayer is effective if the petitioner is a son or a daughter to God. A son or a daughter to God. Now in verse 2, it is said, when the Lord shows how to pray, He said, when you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name. Father, hallowed be your name. And then later on, in the end of the parable, verse 13, 11 to 13, He says again, which of you fathers, if your son asks for a fish, will give him a snake instead and so on. So, prayer is about a relationship, a communication between a son and his father, a daughter and his father. Now, so this is the context of prayer. This is the prayer that is answered by God. Now, that makes, that raises a very important question. Are you son or daughter of God when you pray? Now, you may say, yes, of course. I am son of God. I'm daughter of God, so I can pray and will be effective. Now, let's redefine what is son and daughter of God. Now, you will notice in the Bible that often when they mention people, they will mention them in relation with their father. For instance, when they call a disciple, they will say James, John, they will say sons of Zebedee, their father. Uh, so they will mention people in relation with the name of their father. Now, the name in the Bible's time, it means everything about a person. Nowadays, we just give you know, funny names to our children. You no, know, that sounds cute, that sounds nice. But in the time of the Bible, the name means everything about the person. It means everything, the declaration, the habits, the attributes of the person. That's why, for instance, when the Lord Jesus mentioned, so when the Bible is said in John chapter 1, verse 12, when it is said, Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believe in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Now, let me repeat. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believe in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Now, to believe in his name, what does it mean? To believe in his name. Do you understand that? To believe in his name, then you are son of God. Now, to believe in his name, it means to believe in everything about Christ. That's what it means, because the name means everything about a person. So to believe in his name means to believe in everything, every declaration of Christ. We believe in that. Then, he says, he give the right to become children of God. Now, when you become children of God, I say he give the right. So it's a right. So you become righteous. That's the meaning of being righteous. And that's why, for instance, in James chapter 5, verse 16, he says the prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. So, if we want our prayer to be effective, we need to come as a son or as a daughter. Now, not any kind of son and daughter. Because here he, say, he says, Allow it be your name. So, when you say, Allow it be your name, it means your name has been glorified in my life. Allow it be, it means holy, set apart. So, your name has been set apart in my life. The way I use your name, because I am called your son, so I have your name on me, I'm Christian. That's what it means to so have the name of Christ on earth. And therefore, I am an obedient son, I'm an obedient daughter, 
And therefore, I come before you as that obedient daughter or that obedient son. And then the father will listen. And because he's a father, he will give what the son or the daughter asks. So the question we need to ask ourselves in the first place, when we come to pray, what kind of son or daughter am I when I come to pray? Am I an obedient daughter? An obedient son? What kind of son am I? You know, in France, every Christmas, we have the Father Christmas, and it is a tradition to ask the children to prepare letters to send to the Father Christmas, and then they can ask all kind of toys, favorite toys, and then by Christmas, Father Christmas will come, and he will give the toys to give to the children. Now, I realize the Father Christmas, he doesn't know the children, the children doesn't know him, but it doesn't matter, they can make a list and it will bring the gift. Now this is a dangerous tradition because some of those kids have become adults and maybe some of those kids, we are them. And we have that same habit to go to God like we go to the Christmas, Father Christmas, making a petition, God I need this, I need that. It doesn't work like that, brothers and sisters. It works like that only. If you and I, we have that relation of a son and a daughter to God, an obedient son, an obedient daughter. Charles Spurgeon says, we little know how many of our prayers are abomination to God. I repeat, we little know how many of our prayers are abomination to God. You know, sometimes people come with some prayer request and they say, oh, I have a colleague, I have a friend who is going through this situation. Can we pray for that friend? Can we pray for that colleague? Now, don't get me wrong, brothers and sisters. It's good to pray for non-believers. There is a very amazing story in Luke chapter 5 when uh, some friends, they brought their friend to Jesus and the friend was healed because of the faith of the friends, not because of the man who was, who was sick, but because of the faith of the friends. But having said that, when we pray for those people who are not Christian, who are not sons, daughters of God, when we bring those petitions, actually, the number one petition for us should be that they become sons and daughters of God. It's not that just, oh, let them know, get healed. It's good for them to get healed. But we want them to realize that the one who will heal them, the one who will give them peace, even in the midst of their suffering, has to be their father. So we have to be careful when we take those petitions and we want to pray about them. The point I would like to, to summarize here that prayer is effective when we are a son or a daughter is that what is our relationship with God? When you pray, let's say after this sermon we are going to pray and then you are going to raise your voice maybe. Do you raise your voice being aware that now you are speaking to your father? And if you are speaking to your father, do you have any kind of hindrance, any kind of shame, any kind of blockage barrier between you and God, between you and the family of your fathers or your brothers and sisters, if you have such a thing, then maybe you are not really praying as a son or a daughter. And the Lord is encouraging you to reach that place where you have that confidence that you are speaking to your father in heaven. Now this takes us to the last point. Prayer is effective if the petition is to glorify God. So indeed we come, we pray to our Father, but what kind of prayers we make which are pleasing to God? Not every prayer is pleasing to God. What are those prayers? And I hope this last part of the sermon will be practical. Because here the Lord gives us the Lord's prayer, which is actually an outline. It's not a prayer that is supposed to be learned by heart and then prayed like we some denomination do, actually it's an outline to show us how to pray. And we see many people praying in the Bible, they don't use this, but they use the format, the outline. Now, in this prayer, you will see, brothers and sisters, there is absolutely no basic need that is requested to God. When I say basic need, I mean what you will drink, what you will eat, what you will clothe, what you will have as a house. Those are basic needs. There is nothing like that in this prayer. And it is consistent because the same prayer you can find it in Matthew chapter 6. 
And then in Matthew chapter 6, the Lord explained that we don't have, Matthew chapter 6, verse 25, on the world says that you don't have to worry about what you will eat, what you will drink. He said, those are the pagans who pray for those things. Now, it doesn't mean you never pray, like for instance, you are starving, you don't have money, you don't have a job, you need a job, you cannot pray for that. It doesn't mean that. You may pray for those things. But what he's saying is that this cannot be the heart of your prayer. This cannot be the main reason why you come to God. Because he knows your needs. He will provide for those basic needs. But he's asking you to come to him for something different. And you can see there are four things that the Lord Jesus asks us to pray for in this Lord's Prayer. And those four things, they are not earthly things. He asks for the will of God. He asks for the daily bread, which is not the physical bread, which is the word of God. Matthew chapter 4, verse 4. Men should not live only on bread, but on every word that comes out of the mouth of God. The third thing is forgiveness of our sins. And the fourth thing is the removal of temptation. Now, those four things are not like our basic daily physical needs. These are things which are supposed to glorify God. Now, so the question sometimes people have is, I pray about that thing, but God didn't answer. I pray about this, but God doesn't answer. Maybe we have not been praying for something that glorifies God. And all those four things glorifies God. Let's look at them one by one quickly. Now the first one he says, Your will, your kingdom come. And in Matthew chapter 6 he says, Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Brothers and sisters, I think this is, if you ask me to pick one verse in this Lord's Prayer as the most important one, they are all important of course, but I would incline to that verse, Your kingdom come. Now this is something amazing. You know, all our misery, all the problems we face, all the struggles we have, you know why we have them? It's because we are not doing the will of God. I'm not talking about the challenges that God allows us to go through in order to build us, to make us to grow us. I'm talking about all those misery, those situations, <laughs> sinful situations we fall in. They are because we don't do the will of God. And you see, because we have a free will, we have a strong free will. We have been rebels for many years before we become Christians. And now we become Christians, we want the will of God to supersede, to override our will. And this is a daily prayer. We struggle with making decisions. We make 30,000 decisions per day. We struggle, we make our decisions based on our wisdom and often they are wrong. We want to go for a job. Do we take a time to go and say, God, is it your will for me to go to apply for that job? We don't do those things. We don't take the time to ask God, God, I want you to show me, is it your will that I go? Is it your will that I ask for a promotion? I mean, promotion is a big thing, right? The common wisdom in the world is that if you enter into a company, you have to grow and get promotion and promotion. That's a common wisdom. But is it the will of God? What does God say about that? Is it the will of God that you keep going on promotion? Right now, I have, I have been offered a position to become vice president in our company. But is it the will of God I have to pray about that? Because if I take that position, that means literally I will have less time. I will probably have less time to make a sermon every week. Is it the will of God? Now, some people are much, much smarter than me. They are able to, you know, to manage church, manage many things. They are very fast. They are very fast. Maybe they can do it. But for me, it is, right now, it's not possible. Is it the will of God that I go with this man? Some of us here, maybe are single. You are going to make a big decision that will affect the next 50 years of your life. Is it the will of God to go with that man and to marry him or to marry that woman? Is it the will of God that my daughter, my, my children, they go with this kind of friends at school? You should pray about those things because you can just let your children, let them go, have some friends. The Bible says, bad company corrupts good matters. Is it the will of God for me? In my marriage, the way I respond, when you wake up in the morning and you start praying, you ask God to... His will to supersede your will because if you just count on your wisdom, the next minute you are going to say something you will regret and then you have a problem with your spouse. The will of God, your kingdom come, that's what it means. 
And that's a profound prayer that the Lord asks us to do. And then he says, Give us each day our daily bread. Again, as I mentioned, the daily bread is the word of God. Paul Washer said, If you don't read the Bible, if you don't study the Bible, you die. There are many dead Christians in the church. This is a food to our spirit, to our soul. The bread is a food for our body. Not meditating this every day. It means you are actually fasting a lot. You can fast a lot. You and I, we can fast for days before reading the Bible. That means we will lose weight. I'm talking about the spiritual weight. The daily bread is basically we wake up in the morning. I need the word of God for today. The word of God is a light on my path. It's a, it's a light, it's a lamp on my feet. We sometimes say we would like many people to become Christian. We want our church to grow. But how can we go and share the gospel to people if we don't know the truth? Because we need the word of God. Maybe today you're going to share a word to someone. But we need to understand this truth before we share it. And then the next one he says, forgives our sins. Someone may say, yeah, the Lord Jesus already forgave our sin. He took our sin on the cross. So why do we have to ask again for forgiveness? Now that's not the point here. Our sin has been taken on the cross forever. However, we do sin still. And because we sin, sin creates a separation between us and God. And the very purpose of prayer is to come closer to God. And therefore, when we say forgive our sin, we are telling God, I want to get closer to you. The Bible, Isaiah 59 says, verse 1 and 2 say, His ears is not deaf. He said it's not too short to say it is your sin that makes separation between you and God. The sin separates us, brothers and sisters. If we don't confess, there is a separation. Our prayer is not effective. And then finally he says, lead us not into temptation. I hope everyone can relate to that. We are bombarded by all kinds of temptation every day. TV, radio, school, colleagues, Gossip, discussion around the situation. Even our children can be source of temptation sometimes. You know, we love our children so much that sometimes we tend to accept things because we are afraid that maybe they will, love, they will love us less. And we become tolerant to some things. That's a temptation, brothers and sisters. We must resist to that temptation and say, no, you may not like me. I'm going to hurt you with the truth. But I will not comfort you with a lie, my dear son, my dear daughter. Finally, I would like to conclude uh, this sermon saying uh, when we wake up or we have a time of prayer, brothers and sisters, if we go to those three points, prayer is effective if we come with a shameless courage. Praise is effective if we come as a son or a daughter. Praise is effective if praise is effective if what we are asking for is to glorify God, not us. Prayer is about God, it's not about you and I. If we go through those three points, you know our prayer will look like something like that. And this is the conclusion. You wake up in the morning, you set a time and you say, I'm going to praise, spend the time with God. When you start in the beginning, prayer is a shameless, comes with a shameless audacity. You can come and start by saying what you are struggling right now. When you say it's here, you come as a son and you say, I Lord be your name. I have your name on me. You want to worship God first. You are celebrating God. You are celebrating for all the things he did in your life. So you can take a time, you can put some, some songs for instance. You can listen to some song or you can even sing yourself. And as you sing yourself, you are praising. Say, Allah will be your name. Allah will be means your name is holy, is beautiful, is set apart. So you are praising God. As a son who is marveling, who is admiring his power, who is admiring his father, his, his mother. So you come and you say, I'm praising you. So this can take you easily 10 minutes. Because you are singing. And then you can go into the prayer and say, when you say, 
in the last part when you say the petition is about glorifying God, you can come and then list all the things you are going through right now at work, in your marriage, with your children, and say, Lord, I want to do your will. And you bring those things before you, God. And that's how God will be moved because He knows that you are coming. This is a trouble you have in your heart. You definitely desire to see an answer. Like this man went at midnight. You really want this to happen. The reason why it happens, it doesn't happen for many of us is because we come and we take it very lightly. We make a prayer. Like you know those kids, when we were young, we ran at the door, we knock at the door, and then we run away. We throw the prayer to God. We even don't take time to listen because prayer is not just a monologue. And then we run away. We didn't hear the answer. When we want to glorify God, it's something that is really a deep desire in our heart. This is what will make God answer the prayer. This is a serious request. Like the Canaanite woman, this is a serious request. So brothers and sisters, I would like to encourage all of us as we go into our time of prayer, I hope from now on when you pray, you may remember that you need to come naked. Don't be ashamed. You cannot be ashamed before God. And remember that you are a son, a daughter, an obedient daughter. This is the key for your prayer to be answered, to be effective. And as you pray, don't focus too much on your needs. He knows them. Focus on the needs of the kingdom. To glorify God. As you do it, it will answer your prayer and you will find enjoyment in His presence. May I ask Miles to come and uh, Miles will. Uh... You have a song on YouTube? Oh, sorry, Miles. Do you have a song on YouTube? Yeah. Oh, sorry. I didn't know. I thought you were. So we, we are going to have a song, but then we have uh, another maybe five, ten minutes to pray and I would like to encourage everyone to start practicing the word of God I hope you don't think this is my word the word of God, the word of Christ so as you come and start to pray ask God to give you to remove that shamefulness and do what the Lord asks us and teaches in this Lord's prayer you will see your life of prayer will be different